Okay, so in our last video, we saw that oxygen nucleophiles like water can add into aldehydes and ketones. However, I did want to cover a different group of reactions where alcohols can add in as well. So let's just draw a generic carbonyl. And keep in mind that this can be an aldehyde or a ketone. Doesn't really matter. We know that aldehydes tend to be more electrophilic, therefore they do these reactions more readily. But you can have this react with an alcohol. And in fact, you need two equivalents of your alcohol. So I'm going to talk about why we need two equivalents a little later on, but let's keep that in mind. So we need two equivalents of our alcohol. We need some sort of catalyst. Usually that's our acid catalyst, and I'm gonna write cat down here. And I'm also gonna do a little asterisk right here, and we'll talk about which acids tend to be used more often for these reactions. And when you do this, what happens is you can get your alcohol to add in twice. That's why we need two equivalents here, is to account for um, the addition occurring more than once. All right, and when you do this, you're also going to kick off water as a byproduct, right? So the oxygen that was originally in the carbonyl has to go somewhere, right? Because these OHs, or sorry, not OHs, these alkoxy groups come from each of our alcohols. So this alcohol, oops, sorry, this oxygen has to be kicked off in the form of water. So we do need to account for everything. All right, so let's briefly describe the terminology that's used here. So an aldehyde, when it does this reaction, forms what is called an acetal. That's when two alcohols add into an aldehyde. A ketone, when it performs this reaction, is referred to as a ketal. If you only get one equivalent of your alcohol to add in, then it's called a hemiacetal, meaning halfway there. And if you only get one equivalent of your alcohol to add into a ketone, it's called a hemiketal, meaning it's only halfway there. We'll take a look at what that means here in a second. But I did want to come back to the acid. So let's take a look at the acids that are commonly used. Often when you pick an acid, you want its conjugate base to be a really crummy nucleophile because you don't want it to do any competing chemistry. So often what we use is something like sulfuric acid. The conjugate base is really bulky and resonance stabilized, so it's not a good nucleophile. You can use uh, phosphoric acid, so H3PO4 is another common one. Another one that's common in organic chemistry is called toslic acid. So what the heck does toslic acid look like? Well, what this looks like is a toluyl group that has a sulfonic acid residue in the para position. So this is a good organic acid. These first two are inorganic acids. Sometimes we avoid using them and we can use an organic acid. Doesn't really matter in my book though. I'm just gonna show it all as generic H plus, but I did wanna show you what it looked like. All right. So now let's jump into the mechanism. And luckily the mechanism is pretty straightforward. It's just very steppy. So let's hang in there and we'll get through this. Let's take a look at the mechanism. And to do this mechanism, I'm just gonna pick acetone as my generic ketone. And I'm gonna have two equivalents of methanol as my alcohol. And to show two equivalents, I'm just gonna write it out twice. And we're gonna treat this with a catalytic amount of acid, but to simplify things, I'm just gonna write that as H plus in brackets. All right, so the first step in this reaction is gonna be the carbonyl oxygen getting protonated by our catalytic acid. Some students will ask, well, can't that protonate the methanol as well? It can, but it doesn't really get us anywhere helpful. So there's no point of drawing that out in our reaction mechanism. All right, so at this point, we're in good shape. We've got a really good electrophile, that protonated ketone. And now we can have our methanol attack in. So I'm gonna go ahead and have it attack in right there. So it's a weak nucleophile, but that's okay because the electrophile is unstable having that positive charge. All right, so we're almost there. 
we've got the methanol that's been added in. That oxygen on the methanol will have a positive charge, right? Because it still has that proton. And then we also have our second equivalent of methanol over here. All right, so what we need to do is we need to remove, whoop, I didn't want to cross that out. We need to remove this proton to get to a neutral intermediate. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write minus H plus to indicate that we need to get rid of that proton. All right, so if we do that, we should get to a nice neutral product. And then we're also going to have our second equivalent of methanol floating around. All right, at this point, this intermediate right here is called a hemiketal, meaning one equivalent of our alcohol has added in, but not both. So it's halfway done. Okay, so let's try to figure out what goes on in the next step. So in the next step, what we're going to do is we're going to reprotonate. So you can imagine over here, we said we're going to remove a proton. That can occur via solvent or some sort of organic intermediate. Doesn't matter as long as it's removed. But we still have that proton around, so we're going to reinsert it down here. All right, so let's show the arrow pushing for that. In this next step, either oxygen can get protonated. But if we protonated this oxygen over here, we'd just be going backwards in the equilibrium. So it makes more sense to protonate the other alcohol, specifically that OH group. All right, so when we've done that, we're going to get an intermediate that's now OH2, right? And then on the other side, we still have the OME group. All right, so we've got that added in. We still have our methanol floating around. But as I've told you throughout the year, anytime you form H2O where the oxygen's positive, that's a really good leaving group. All right, so we've got this good leaving group, and we also have lone pairs that we haven't drawn in, but are assumed on that oxygen. So what we can do next is we can just eject off that leaving group before anything else happens. So now we've got this intermediate, we've kicked off water. Water was our good leaving group that just got kicked off, right? And we still have methanol floating around. All right, so if we think about it, this intermediate has an oxygen with a positive charge, right? That means it's really unstable and it kind of looks like this intermediate that we had up above. So what we could do is have some equivalent of methanol attack into that electrophile, just like we did in that second step. So let's go ahead and show that. So in this step, methanol can attack in and kick up electrons. And now we've got two equivalents of our methanol added in but the one that was just added in still has its proton. And we still have water floating around. And our very last step is just gonna be to remove that proton. So I'll just write minus H plus. We need to remove this proton right here to get to our neutral organic product. So we've gone ahead and we've got two equivalents of our alcohol added in, and then water is going to be our byproduct for this reaction. So this final product that we've formed right here would be our ketel, meaning both equivalents of our alcohol have added in. So as you can see, this overall reaction mechanism is kind of steppy. We've got a lot of proton transfers to account for. 
However, we don't gain or lose any of our acid, meaning it's catalytic throughout the entire process. All right, so then the question is, well, how could we favor formation of our ketal, right? How can we favor formation of this product down here if everything's under equilibrium conditions? Well, there's a few different tricks. If you remember back to general chemistry, you can utilize Le Chatelier's principle to shift the position of the equilibrium. So let's make a few notes here. So you can favor a product I'm going to write ketal or acetal. You can favor ketal or acetal formation one of two different ways. Number one is you can remove water from the reaction as it proceeds. So let's take a look at this, right? If we look at the overall equilibrium, right? Water is one of our products. So if we keep on removing water from the reaction, we're gonna continue to push the equilibrium forward to our ketal side. So we're removing one of our products to shift the equilibrium to the product side. So that works well. Number two is a little bit different. Instead of removing water, another strategy, is just flood it with a ton of methanol, right? If we flood it with a ton of starting material, we're gonna push the equilibrium to the opposite side. So let's include that as well. The second strategy is useful, especially if you're using a cheap alcohol. So for example, methanol is really cheap, same with ethanol. However, if you have a really expensive organic alcohol, it tends to make more sense to go with option number one. You don't wanna waste money with option number two. All right, so now let's take a short break. And then when we come back, we can look at how to form cyclic acetals and ketals.